Thank you very much. I want to thank my brother all the way in Moscow for putting together this conversation in which we pause and try to answer a subject that has become very topical, not only in Nigeria, but in the continent of Africa. I speak at a time in Africa when all of us are aware that courtesy of the African Union, we declared this year as the year of silencing of the guns. We say we want to silence the guns as a condition precedent to creating an environment where our continent can realize our potential economically, politically and otherwise. But the irony and the tragedy at once is that when history is written, this year may be described as Anna's Horribilis, the year of horror, if you may. It is the year when our economies have been shut down, courtesy of COVID or Corona. It is the year when economies have shrunk. It is the year when our young men and women have lost opportunities. It is the year when our young men and women and even old men and women who sojourned in other parts of the world have had to come home. It has been a bad year. It is also the year when instead of guns going silent, we have seen in different parts of Africa a violence taking root. We have witnessed the exploits of Boko Haram in the Sahelian region. We have seen uh, the escalation of violence in Ambazonia in Cameroon. We have seen the violence in Libya growing worse. We have seen the insurgency in Mozambique. We have seen young men and women rise up in different parts of Africa. We have seen them rise up in Guinea Conakry. We have seen them rise up in La Côte d'Ivoire. We have seen them rise up in Mali. We have seen the activities of many violent organizations in Eastern Congo. We are aware of the ongoing conflict in the Nuba Mountains in Sudan. We are also witnessing as I speak the conflict between the federal government of Ethiopia and the region of Tigray, threatening a civil war in Ethiopia, at the headquarters of the African Union. It is the year when Nigeria, Africa's most populous nation, experienced something unprecedented since the civil war in 1967 when young men and women came out into the streets and demanded of their government that certain things must be halted. The emblematic statements and SARS may be seen in their narrow sense, but if one digs a little deeper, one recognizes that their pent up anger is what propelled the young men and women to rise up and come into the streets. Some may say that the protests have been brought to an end, but I dare say that this, if we are not careful, could be a lull before the storm, which then legitimizes the conversation that we will have uh, this afternoon. The African continent is a continent that has known pain. And in order to understand her pain, one has to talk about her history, albeit only briefly. This continent has known slavery. It has known the commodification of her sons and daughters. It has seen her sons and daughters being taken away forcibly 
to other parts of the world, to develop those other parts of the world. This is a continent about which the Caucasian tribes, the Germans, the Portuguese, the English, the Spaniards, the Danes, the Belgians, sat in Berlin in 1884 to 1885 and simply divided the continent into what they described as their spheres of influence. So arbitrary was the division that if you go to many countries in Africa, you find a people divided. Find the Yoruba of Nigeria in Togo. You find them in Benin. You find even some of them in Cameroon. You find the Fulani in Niger, in Nigeria. You find the Wolof in Senegal and in Gambia. You find the Bangala in Congo Democratic Republic and in the other Congo, normally referred to as Congo Brazzaville. You find the Luo in Sudan, in South Sudan, in Uganda, in Tanzania, in Kenya. You find the Somali in Ethiopia, in Somali, in Kenya, in Djibouti. That is the continent that we are in. A continent that was so harshly and arbitrarily divided. And yet that continent and our people, even in times of pain, has never abandoned the struggle to regain her dignity and her independence. And it's in that context that we can understand the entire struggle to regain our independence, which gained momentum in the 1950s, but had started in earnest even a little earlier. It is that continent about which many Africans and Africans in the diaspora met in Manchester in 1945. It is this continent, which is our continent about which Marcus Garvey was speaking about in the 19th century. It is this continent about which W.B. Du Bois was speaking about at that time. It is this continent that was so abused that when in 1945, the so-called international community sat down in San Francisco in the United States of America to come up with the United Nations Charter. It was not represented. And if it was by Liberia and Ethiopia, then it was token representation. It is that continent which when the so-called international community sat down in Paris in 1948 and talked about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the black man was not contemplated as human at that time. It is that continent which her sons and daughters were fighting and it is only when the European tribes had fought in the Second World War and the luster of colonization was no longer attractive that they agreed to free the continent. That is the continent in which we find ourselves. And this continent, when she was regaining her independence, the erstwhile colonizer designed it for failure. That is why Ghana's Osagie for Kwame Nukuruma was so very clear when on in the month of December 1958, he called the compatriots in Accra, talked about the imperialists. He said, the imperialist has two handmaidens, colonization and neocolonization. Imperialism does not change its character, it only changes its mask. It is about this continent that he was talking about and the people who periodically afflict her in many ways. It is about that continent that you and me know that when the British were leaving Nigeria, having administered Nigeria separately in the North and the South, they put it together knowing that it would be a powder cake. And they did not only do it there, they did it with the Bakasi in Cameroon. They did it with La, La Republique in Cameroon and the former British Cameroons. They did it in Somalia with former British Somaliland and Italian Somaliland. They did it in Sudan, 
having administered the North, Arabized and Islamized on the eve of independence in 1956, they put them together. It is the same thing that they did in what was then called Rhodesia and Nyasaland, which we now call Zimbabwe and Malawi and Zambia. They did it deliberately in the hope that they would not succeed and they would come. And therefore, when we, were, we are engaging in a conversation such as this, that history is necessary because that history is a history that has preoccupied the minds of the founding fathers of the continent of Africa. I remember courtesy of history so very vividly that in the month of May, 1963, on the 24th and 25th days of May to be exact, when the 32 heads of state of the then independent African countries met in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Your own Namdi Azikiwe was present. Your own Abubakar Tafawa Balewa was present. And the issue on the table at that time was whether Africa should redraw and redefine the colonially inherited boundaries. There were many debates. There were those who thought that we should go into that exercise. But the argument that carried the day was an argument that was articulated by four individuals a lot more eloquently than anybody else. Julius Kambarage Nyerere of Tanzania said, if we begin to redraw the boundaries now, tell me which African country would not be in conflict with the other country. Let us retain them. Let us make them the best we can. Let us make them bridges rather than barriers. The other person who took the mantle was Gamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt, who said the same thing, not in similar words, but in effect. The other one was Ahmed Ben Bella of Algeria. But the most eloquent and perhaps the most passionate on the day was the Osage for Kwame Nkrumah, who took the view that we should not talk about drawing our boundaries when our agenda should be to unite the continent of Africa so that we create a United States of Africa. That argument so entered into the Organization of African Unity Charter, a clause which said and talked about the inviolability of inherited boundaries. The argument a year later was taken to Cairo in 1964 and it was confirmed, and the United Nations also embraced it. So that we inherited artificial boundaries, but no sooner had we settled into our regained independence than the erstwhile colonizers started using their diabolical machinations to undermine the independent states. It is not mine to say, but it's better to remind us that as soon as Togo regained her independence. She was one of the very first victims with Silvanus Olympi overthrown. As soon as the Democratic Republic of Congo regained her independence, Patrice Emery Lumumba was removed from power. And so soon thereafter, in the 1960s, the era of coups, we started seeing fourth columnists who are our own dark skinned individuals being used and recruited by the erstwhile colonizer to disturb, destabilize our countries. We saw the Osage for himself removed in 1960 and in your own country, in Nigeria in 1967, the government of Namdi Azikiwe and Abu Bakr Tafawa Balewa was overthrown. At that time, it is instructive that there were mutinies almost everywhere. There was a mutiny in Kenya, there was a mutiny in Tanzania, there was a mutiny in Uganda, there was an attempted mutiny in Zambia. All these were diabolical machinations. So that when we begin to ask the question as to what we should do in Africa now, we must ask ourselves what history did we inherit and what can we do with it, particularly now that we are talking about African unity. Is it improper to talk about African unity and also to talk about self-determination? I was just the other day looking at the history of a country called Switzerland. And what intrigued me is that 
Switzerland has had a history that is very similar to many African countries, a small country in the heart of Europe, which has German speakers, French speakers, Italian speakers, and Romanish speakers. And I reminded myself that when the Swiss country was created, the first confederal act was in the year 1291, when the cantons agreed to come together. They were negotiating their country. I then remembered that that particular negotiation took place again in the year 1803, when they had a federal constitution. And it did not stop there. They had a confederal constitution or confederal treaty in the year 1815. And it did not stop there. In 1848, they had another conversation. And it did not stop there. In 1874, they had another conversation. And it did not stop there. In 1898, they had another conversation. And it did not stop there. In 1998, they had another conversation. What that tells me is that when you are talking about the life of a nation, there must be constant conversation around the character of a country. In Nigeria, we remember what happened in the early days. You remember the activities in 1960s that led to the coup d'etat. And you remember what led to the civil war. And you remember the famous, depending on who you are talking to, it is either famous or infamous, the Aburi Accord, of which Odume Gwojuku said, by Aburi we stand, and General Gowon said, by Aburi you shall fall. And we know that over the years, there have been agitations and quiet dissatisfaction. If it does not come from the Biafra, as articulated by Odumegu Ojuku in those early days, they are muted agitations from the Odudua Republic. And there are those from the house of Hausa Fulani who also say mutedly, you have taken everything else. You have everything else you need. Now you want to take the only thing that we have, power. And I think that these conversations are necessary. The question that some would ask, is it incompatible to talk about self-determination and talk about African unity? I think not. I now hold the view that many African countries have reached a stage where they must renegotiate how they relate to one another. And you can see that it is right. And I'll start from a number of countries. Go to the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is the size of Western Europe. The Democratic Republic of Congo has known no peace for a long time, since the 1960s. And I remember so very well in 1961, during the prime ministership of Patrice Emery Lumumba and the presidency of Joseph, Joseph Kasavubu, what happened is that the Katangis wanted to secede, the people of Kasai wanted to secede, even as we speak now, the government in Kinshasa does not have a proper hold of the entire country. Is, this, is there not a case for renegotiating the country to determine whether if it became federal or confederal, it would be a little bit more sustainable? Is there not a case for such negotiation? In the Cameroon, which as you know, the French part was administered as the La République by the French and the British inherited what they call British Cameroons from the Germans after the war. And you know that they were administered separately. Right now, you and me know the pain that the Bia regime has been visiting on the people of Southern Cameroons or Ambazonia. Isn't there a case for a negotiation in that area? You and me know the problems in the Arab Democratic Republic of Sahrawi or sometimes referred to as Western Sahara, is there not a case for a conversation involving Morocco? In the Casamance in Senegal, is there not a case for a conversation? In Northern Mali, where we know that the government in Bamako does not have complete control, is there not a case for negotiation and discussion? Is there not a case 
for conversation in places such as the Republic, the Democratic Republic of, uh, of Ethiopia that we are talking about now. Remember when the administration of uh, Mele Zenawi came, one of the things that they did with their constitution was to insert in the constitution that indeed countries could secede. Right now in Ethiopia, we know about, rather in Somalia, we know about the Somali land with an administration in Hargeisa, which is not recognized. Is there, there not a case for a discussion around that? And when you come to your own Nigeria, is it not a possibility that indeed there is wisdom in renegotiating the state? And renegotiating the state does not mean that you break up. Is like having your adult children living within your own house. And they think that the bedroom in your house is no longer big enough. So they go out and they enjoy some kind of autonomy, but the center is still alive and well and informing their activities. I think that there is a case for serious renegotiation. Those of you like Amarachi who are in the what we call the former Soviet Union. During our very own lifetime, we saw how the Soviet Union crumbled. Who knew that Ukraine would be a separate country? Who knew that Georgia would be separate? Who knew that Turkmenistan would be separate? Who knew that Armenia would be separate? Who knew that Azerbaijan would be separate? In Yugoslavia, who knew that we would have uh, separate countries. Who knew that Czechoslovakia would create the Czech Republic and Slovakia? Who knew that all these things would happen? This history and these examples are critical and it requires a leadership that is conscious of the possibility that there is a historical window which only exists for a short time that begs the question as to whether there is not a case for what one calls a national dialogue. The South Africans would call it a national indaba. And at that indaba, all issues are on the table. I gave the example of Switzerland a few minutes ago, and the Swiss say that each of the cantons will have such sovereignty to the extent that is not delimited by the confederal constitution. I believe that many African countries with the rise of nationalism now have a justification for renegotiating their countries for purposes of strengthening them. I think the right to self-determination without destroying the countries is something that ought to be accommodate, accommodated. 